Rena Strober, and you are listening to the audio description Narrators of America Know Your Narrator series. Beyond your narrator episode. We are proud to welcome Serena Gilbert and Jeff Thompson of Blind Abilities Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Roy. I'm, I know I'm really excited. I bet Jeff is too. I am. I'm really excited. Nice to be here, Roy. <laughs> Thanks for having it. Well, tables are turned here. Let's start with uh, Serena. What do you love about audio description? I love that I can sit around the table and be able to have a, an equal playing field to talk about the latest mainstream media and movies and enjoy it just as much as somebody with sight, if not more. Very cool. That, in, that inclusion really makes a difference. Jeff, what about you? I like the fact that audio description fills the gaps, fills the voids, fills the spaces that I'd be wondering about, especially in movies that go silent for a while. I just, I can comprehend and it it actually fills me with what I need from, you know, th that I'm missing through the lack of sight, what I can't pick up. And I can do that whether I'm paying attention to it, like trying to see it or whether it's just in the background and not distracting me from it, but I, it just fills in. And I don't even notice it's happening if it's really good. I just don't even notice it happening. And so like Serena says, you, you gain from it, you can have conversations about it, and it's just normal to me. Let's talk a little more about that. You don't even notice it's happening. I love how you put that. Can you talk a little more in detail about what that means to you as far as you don't notice it's happening, but it's still filling in the gaps? Well, Roy, and the listeners, I used to be able to see, I used to watch movies all the time, go to theaters and everything. So I know the experience of what taking in um, physical motion or facial expressions is. And when I lost that, you know, someone rolls their eyes. I can hear that sometimes. But in movies, they don't always play into that from a visual point of view. They don't think, hey, let's put this in here, a big sigh. That'll sound like eyes rolling. However with audio description, all those nuances, all those little subtleties that go unnoticed to people because they take it in are explained to me or defined for me and carry me along. And by not noticing it is I'm on the same track as everyone else that's in the room watching or that has watched it. It's not like I have to find out later what really happened from someone or have someone whisper or anything. It's just happening. And you know, it's gotten to the point where that's what I want, that's what I expect, and if I don't get that, um, I'm distracted, and I don't get the full essence of what the movie's about. Thanks for that, Jeff. What about and you, I would Sarah? agree with Jeff. Like, I am the biggest audio description snob there might be. I don't know. That's a self-proclaimed title I'm giving myself. But <laughs> to, to kind of piggyback on what Jeff said, to not even know that it's happening, for example, like just, just be able to just sit there and relax. And for me, that means a good like voice pairing and that the, the voice is in the same manner, I guess, for lack of a better word, as the movie is. So if it's an animated movie, it's an animated t sounding voice and it's just there. And it sounds like that. I mean, it shouldn't be distracting is the thing. And I've definitely experienced some times where I'm like, why did they choose this voice? <laughs> it's super distracting. Or maybe the mix is not very good. And by that, I mean, it's, you can hear the audio description when it's just, you know, a couple people talking at their kitchen table, but the next scene where it's massive action in the streets of New York City, you can barely hear the audio description. And that's where I get really frustrated with it. Yeah, you brought up three really good points. The, the casting, the audio mix, and the, the same manner as the movie. I love that. Have you had any influence on audio description quality to encourage more snobbery? Snobbery. I like that. <laughs> Is that going to be the word of 2020? There you go, Roy. Okay. Like we're, we're, we're sending it out there. Anything goes um, I, yeah, For real. <laughs> Nothing surprises me this year ever. Uh, <laughs> um, I have actually started, um, thanks to you, Mr. Samuelson, um, dipping my toe in some quality assurance um, to help out with running quality control on some more complicated titles where it'd be a little, sometimes it's like, how do we describe this? I don't know. What do you envision when we say this? I've been consulted on a few different projects like that, really interesting movies and 
things that I can't wait to hit mainstream so I can see what people think of the description tracks. But I've learned a lot about what they consider, you know, good quality audio description um, in regards to certain ways that things are written and why they're written that way and the style and things like that. And I think it's super fun. I kind of get paid to watch movies. So <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Very cool. And Jeff, what about you? That you've um in your contribution to making sure that audio description snobbery, <laughs> audio description excellence is happening, uh, what's been your experience? Well, listening to people who are interested in doing audio description, describing, narrating, there, it's a neat place to be because there, there's a lot of the people that I've experienced have been really good at it, and it seems interesting to hear the different voices for different tracks how they can fit in even if that may not be the voice that you would use for it it seems like the people who are interested in it give enough attention to detail that they seem to find that cadence the uh, the rhythm uh, and to let their voice just settle right into the the mix of everything that's where it gets lost and what i mean by lost is that's where i'm into the movie and that's perfect. Um, I remember one person said, I sound too like I'm going too much at a cadence. And I had to tell them that that's what I love is, you know, if there's a rat-a-tat-tat going on that, and that voice just bent, blends in with it, it's smooth. But if you have something going at a different cadence, it just doesn't sound right. It just, to you know, if it's going to settle in there real good, it's got to fit. And I think the people that I've experienced have done a great job on it, and it's neat to be able to be part of that as they're doing it raw, just right from script, just boom, and you get to experience that, and it's like, wow, this is how it comes to life, you know? It was really cool. And it's neat to hear that your feedback makes a difference. As a, as a voice talent, I find that I have expectations of how I'm coming across just because I'm hearing my voice from inside my own body. And so that alone, you know, kind of like some people have heard their own voicemail greeting back when we used to use voicemails that it was kind of jarring. Like, who is that? But everyone's already used to your voice. But I was I was used to it hearing my voice from my perspective. And it took a lot of those kinds of voiceover workouts, kind of like a gym where I go and practice these things that that's how voice talents can develop their craft specifically when in audio description. And it's really neat to know that they are doing that, that they're not just jumping on like a side job or something like that, that they're actually taking this serious, serious and doing a good job at doing it because a lot of people do appreciate, like Serena was saying, uh, as quality assurance, a lot of people do appreciate the part of not getting distracted. Like, why are they using that voice? As soon as I go into that mode, I'm pretty much done. I just shift <laughs> and I become a critic. And I didn't want to watch a movie to become a critic of audio description. So and cool. that happens to me a little bit too, um, more in regards to maybe the script writing. Because I, th I think you've covered this, Roy, like the process of um, there being a script writer and then some quality assurance, and then it goes to, to the voice artist and a director and I'm in sound engineer, all that fun stuff. Um, it's more than like I, I, before I got into this and started learning about it, I truly thought Roy Samuelson described, I think you did Spider-Man. You did one of the Spider-Mans. There's like too many to remember, <laughs> but I was like, okay, so Roy, you know, wrote this and voiced it. Like I just, I didn't know because nobody ever really talks about it, but, um, it, it takes a team is kind of what I'm trying to get it at it to, to really bring all that together. Obviously the voice talent is super important, but it also takes like a really gifted sound engineer and director as well to get that into the spot. Sometimes you have to fit 10 words into like a really small spot. And I bet Roy, you've had some doozies there um, to make it sound okay, where it's not like you're running, you know? Yeah. Um, and it takes a, a, a big team to, to, to really produce a, a good quality track. Yeah, it does make a difference. And there are some people that have been doing multiple aspects of it, almost like a, a, a cinematic auteur that, is a, that they are able to, to do the writing and the, the engineering and the directing and the, and the writing. But I've been 
misinterpreted as a, a writer on many occasions, just because you hear the voice uh, when I'm voicing it. And I, I always like to point back to the writers and, and the whole team, because that awareness, I think, is something that, that does make a difference. And, and Serena, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, too, with the, uh, with the audio description discussion group on Facebook. The, there's a lot of engagement happening there with, with hundreds of people from all different kinds of perspectives, just uh, not only just the audience's side, but also the content creators. What do you see happening there in the, uh, in the conversations? So I see a lot of people posting, like you said, from all like aspects of the audio description experience. I've seen um, project managers post, um, like when Breaking Bad was public, that you know all the tracks were available and they talked about how hard it was for them to not tell us <laughs> that it was in the works for like five months. I've seen writers and voice artists asking for genuine feedback on, hey, what do you guys think of this? And, or I've seen, I've definitely seen script writers in there asking, you know, I'm, I've got this going on. Like, what, do you, what is your suggestion? And people will chime in. One person that's super active in there is actually someone from Disney, I believe. And I forget his name, Roy, you might remember it, but he is constantly updating the group on what Disney Plus is adding with description and kind of taking requests, it almost seems, because <laughs> there's a post there that's got lots and lots of comments where people are like, is this described? Can you describe this? And he'll be like, it's on the list or, you know, it's already out there or whatever the case may be. I think it's one of the only places on the internet right now where you can go and really connect with people at all levels at audio description from people who love it to people who produce it and everything in between. One of the cool things about that group is that, uh, as you had said earlier, uh, Jeff, filling in the gaps that we're also filling in the gaps between the, the audience and the entertainment industry, making sure that that connection does deliver the results that, that each group wants and that care and, and concern for, for top quality does, does really come through. One of the things that I really loved about Blind Abilities is how you're also advocating for all kinds of things in, in your conversations in really playful, entertaining ways. Can you talk a little bit about your podcast and some of the things that you've done? Serena and I do a show. It's, um, I got to think of the name sometimes. We've done so many different, we have job insights. We've done shows right now. We got one going that's, um, Serena, you got to help me out here. <laughs> Tech Abilities. Uh, it's, right. it's not complicated. It's half of the company name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do tech abilities. And it, it's a show that we're trying to get for technology. We've done other shows with technology, but we're coming around to where we want to be educational and have tech be kind of the premise of what we're doing on blind abilities we do success stories and we do stories about people like you've been on Roy quite a few times whether it be on just a spotlight on Roy Samuelson or whether it be just a show where we're having a discussion about audio description and they've all been good and they've all been on different types of shows like people who want to get into audio description or you know you've been very informational on that so on blind abilities we try to service a lot of the 14 to 21 year olds for the transition aid students um, throughout the United States and from there there's a lot of tech and stories about successes and stuff that happen. Um, everyone has their own Kilimanjaro. It doesn't ha necessarily have to be that mountain. It can be just, you know, making it to the bus stop successfully or whatever it is, whatever your hurdle is that you have to overcome, the barricades and brick walls. We try and bring success stories to help others see the possibilities that come out of that. And audio description, when, after we had you on, Roy, I think you've really lit it up, um, connecting up with the audio description group and other areas that you've brought awareness to especially the quality of audio description. So it, you know, it feels great to be part of when we first start talking and to where it is now to see this growth happening and other podcasts being started and like talk description to me, um, some other ones that are out there. It's just interesting to see where this is going. And it just seems it's a good time for audio description compared to where it was five, 10, 15 years ago. It's really great to see all the conversations happening. And let's talk about that, that future 
could each of you talk about where you would love to see audio description go just based on, let's say, dream world or maybe uh, how things are right now and just where you want to see it go? Serena? Well, I would like to see us be as far as accessibility to where England is, where everything I think it is except for their news and their live sports is required to have audio description. I'd like to see the United States get on that same level with that requirement of audio description, but not just that it's audio description. Like I, I want to keep the quality um, that we're seeing in, in quite a few of the major companies. I don't want it to just be, well, here's the description, have fun. I want it to be high quality audio description and it's just the standard, just like subtitles or closed captioning is. It should never be an afterthought or I guess we should do this because somebody's making me. It should just be the norm, just like closed captioning. Exactly. I, I mean, I'd just be repeating what she's saying, but you know, bringing that to theaters, bringing that to movie productions, bringing that all the way to the museums and everywhere, the, the walks of life. I mean, I want a Roy Samuelson or a J.J. Hunt on my in my pocket, you know, um, wherever you go, it'd be nice to have something to describe more. I mean, I've seen object recognition apps that try, you know, it's a table and a chair. Well, okay. At least they don't recognize the whole dirty dishes in the <laughs> sink or something like that. But with audio description being prevalent, more places and more of the norm, it would be, you know, some people wonder why people with visual impairments and who are blind don't get out too much or don't realize what's around them and all. that's why they don't have the description so when we have productions that are being made it just makes sense to have audio description there to bring more people into the mix of it and going back to what serena says to be part of the conversation of, of something that people are watching at the water bubbler or whatever they're talking at work or something like that it's just it just feels good to be inclusive when actually being visually impaired you miss so much and have an audio description it just levels that playing field and brings you right even pace with everyone else i bet everyone can tell exactly where jeff is from since he called it a water bubbler just just pointing that out i wasn't going to comment on it but i was thinking is that the room temperature version of the cooler uh, this is a script uh, talk to the writer <laughs> i see how you deflect that's well played <laughs> Uh, that's great. One of the things that came up in that, in that, in those dream scenarios that really seem like they're going to be happening is that audio description itself can be a, a spectrum or a range. And some of the things that, that we've talked about as far as quality and excellence goes in audio description is that even within audio description, it's not does it have it or not? But there is a range that uh, the first example I can think of that comes to mind is using a voice over on iPhone or a screen reader where it just gives factual information. And then that goes all the way to a level 10 of your, uh, your spouse or your child or your friend that's next to you on the couch that's just shouting at the TV saying what's happening. That those, that even within audio description, there can be that range. Can you maybe address what your experience is like as far as the interrupting the binary, does it have it or not, to you know, a lot of the the range that could happen with audio description. Well, one thing that I've been learning a lot when trying to learn this new quality assurance piece of things is making sure that the audio description is not filling in the story for blind people. And and I know that sounds really weird. What I mean is it should be, you, it should really literally be telling you, you know, the same thing that the sighted audience is seeing. It shouldn't be patronizing or you know, you hear cell phone ring and the audio describer says, just writes, he, 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 his, his cell phone rings. Like we know that, you know, um, it should be respectful and, and things like that. And that's where that balance sometimes is hard, especially on um, things that are, are thrown together really quickly without having blind and visually impaired consultants on, because sometimes individuals might think that this is the perfect way of describing this, but then you ask six individuals that are blind or visually impaired and none of them has that picture in their head of the way it was described. And I think to get that balance on that spectrum, you have to include individuals that use the content and, and are the, your customers essentially to make sure that it's done right. Wow. You're right. There's no mathematical way of doing it that everybody 
gets the same perception or perspective from someone doing audio description as another person, but the, I think there's a sweet spot of, you know, in, in a range of like four to six or seven, somewhere in there, that will be s subtle enough for everyone to grasp. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, and yet is there a perfect way? I don't think you can hit perfection because there's so many, like all the people on audio description group, everyone has their own needs or understand things at a certain way. So I think it's an art of what you and your teams are doing, Roy and Serena, and everyone involved in the, the teamwork. You know, there might be 10 people involved to get this audio track onto the movie or whatever, wherever you're listening to it. But to get it in that groove that it works for the majority of people is quite the craft. And I, really starting to understand that when Roy you peeled apart the layers of what it takes to get that voice onto a movie in in a track it's like very I don't know it's very enlightening to see the teamwork that it takes to actually produce such good quality work and I'm glad that people are listening and the the voices are being heard around the industry and oh, I hope they are being heard around the industry to keep this gain going, the improvement and, and the inclusion going, because you know it's it's just I don't know I, I'm I'm rambling on here, but it's just something that I appreciate so much that if I don't even notice it's there, it's perfect. And I've said that before, but it's just one of those things that you don't realize how much work is going on in the background all the time to make this stuff happen and we just turn it on like oh we're just watching a movie with audio description and not even expecting anything less i don't does that make sense oh i love it and i think could... it makes sense um sorry roy um pardon me i i i'm gonna step on the soapbox a little bit so feel free to edit it out if you need to Do it. Um, but i mean jeff jeff you're I, I wouldn't say you're a casual watcher of audio description, but you 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 obviously understand the level of work that goes into it more than probably the average person. And I don't even know, I couldn't even calculate how many hours and hours of work it is. I would guess for an hour show just to get audio description done, it's probably a good 15 to 20 hours of work when you factor in the script writing, the quality assurance, the voice work, the editing, all that stuff. And it's super frustrating because it's as an industry, I don't think it's respected like in LA and Hollywood and your neck of the woods over there, Roy. Um, <laughs> my favorite state in the world though. Um, and when you look at, you know, how my, everyone's like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. That the amount of money that is, it, is infused in the budget to pay for audio description is like pennies. It, it's super sad how little it's paying. And I, they, I truly think that they probably spend more on one day's worth of catering than they would on the audio description track because that is how little they really care about it and that's just how the industry is right now. But I would encourage people that if you encounter really good audio description to you know shout out those companies and bring recognition to the companies that are doing great audio description and make sure you're pointing it out so that the major studios recognize like when somebody's doing a good job and hopefully can encourage and continue to encourage quality work for audio description great soapbox thanks for sharing that i know i jeff has this little sound effect he puts in our podcast whenever i get on my soapbox mm -hmm. and that's exactly how many steps he gives me because I'm like, he thinks I'm super short. I'm 5'3". It's not like horribly short, but I am short. There's only three steps, but it takes her 20 to yeah. get to the top. Yeah, it sounded like He's half like, the flight the way Why there's so many steps? He does like six steps <laughs> <laughs> to get on a soapbox. <laughs> but you always make a great point, and I like having that soapbox, and I'm glad you brought it to this show because, you know, you do make great points about it and your involvement in it you know, is making a difference. And, you know, seeing these people that I got to coach a little bit, it really makes me feel like you can make an impact, you know. That's why so many voices that are out there need to be heard and shared. And I think, you know, Roy, ever since I've met you and stuff and followed your your Twitter feeds, your your 
Facebook groups and your postings, your podcasts and all that. It's just been, you know, uh, Serena said that I, I'm a casual listener of audio description, but when I have audio description, it's on. Um, like Bosch, I watch Bosch. Bosch is great because it has audio description as well. So I like watching that. There's so many shows that I do like to watch, and I usually binge binge watch them when I do. But some people are busy people, and but when with audio description there, it just makes it more pleasant. More I get more out of it. I look forward to. I, I want to binge it, you know, because it, it's working for me. And I want to thank you, Roy, for what you're doing to bring awareness. And I mentioned that earlier, but you know, if you if people can't bring awareness and bring their voices out there to be heard, then no one knows there's a problem. No one knows there's goodness. No one knows anything about it. But right now, I think with all the voices that are out there talking about it in discussion is just helping everybody and people are more aware of it. And then the ACB group over there having that um, resource for people to get it where they want to, if they want to listen to stuff, you know, it's it's available to them. I think it's become almost a household word nowadays, audio description, where before it was one of these things that should we have it or shouldn't we have it? You know, They used to argue that we shouldn't have audio description until they do the weather report, that, that beep, beep, beep at the bottom of the TV screen. They should audio describe that first, you know, and now look where, where we are today. There's so many opportunities to get audio description that I, I like it. I really do. And to go back to one of the first comments that you said, Serena, about the uh, that being at the table and having that intelligent conversation about a TV show, that that is a form of connection. The audio description is <laughs> really filling in the gaps. I'm, I might be pushing the analogy here, but I'm imagining this freeway where you have to go 55 miles an hour, 65, 75, and it's filled with potholes and the you have to fill in those gaps so that you can be on the road with everybody else. The, I, I'm really stretching the analogy, and I will never use that analogy again. Oh, no, it's a good one because, you know, it's not a smooth road unless you fill it in. And for us, we stop at those potholes and we wonder and we're missing the next part because we're confused. We're like, huh, what the, is that? And the movie keeps going at its own pace. But we stop at every pothole and step over it trying to gather what happened and then we miss a little bit. And then if we have to ask someone what just happened, then everyone misses it and they all hit the potholes. So I like that analogy. <laughs> yeah, and the potholes I think it's are... a great one too. Yeah. We also have the potholes of the, the voice talents, the potholes of the writers, the potholes of the mix. The, <laughs> it can, uh, there's all sorts of little ways that it can get your, your, your car out of alignment. Okay, now I've pushed it. It's a good analogy. I like it, though. I was going to make a joke. I was like, it sounds like Roy goes 75 in the 55. Um, <laughs> I was pushing. It, it seems like I would the way that analogy went. I might have to, I might have to edit that part out. <laughs> you might ah. get a ticket in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> driving while podcasting. Uh, do, uh, <laughs> do either of you have anything else that you'd love to share with our audience? <laughs> I had my soapbox. <laughs> I, I, I've always been super passionate about audio description. I love what the um, audio description project has done to bring awareness. That was how I discovered a lot of the places to even watch audio description. I still remember the first show that I watched with audio description um, back in, I think it was like 2012. <laughs> um, it's funny the things that you remember just randomly and I could not imagine going back to watching things without audio description. It was so tiring and who knows how much I missed. I, I could not imagine it without it now. Yeah. I remember I was teaching at a adjustment to training center and they were kind of in the mode where audio description hasn't reached its popularity yet. And a lot of people were indecisive that they need it or not. And they wanted to show that you really don't need it. And they put on Forrest Gump, which was audio described and everyone <laughs> loved it. It was just so you know that that feather in the beginning just everything was great and it just backfired and it really settled in so that's the one i remember as being so great probably because someone else was trying to make it sound like we didn't need it or something and i think we i'm glad we've come to this place now where the the inclusion is you know a common word that everyone's using and that audio description has found its place in the uh, community and in the industry 
Well, and I, that brings up kind of a good point, Jeff. I feel like there was a time when we could get by without audio description a lot. Cause even when you think to like dramas back, even in like, let's say mid, mid to early 2000s, they were not shot or filmed or even written in the same manner that they are today. Like it was um, a lot of like, I'm watching uh, Gilmore Girls on Netflix. I don't know exactly what years that came on, but I'm guessing it's mid 2000s, maybe early. And that show is super easy to watch with the audio description because there's so many audio cues because it's just written very it's in a formula. It's not hard to figure out what's going on. The characters' voices are very distinct. Like, you know what's going on. But now, fast forward now, and gosh, try to watch Orange is the New Black without audio description. You won't know what's going on. Um, You will be completely lost after the first episode. It's because things are just written in a far more cinematic way now, where they're not just feeding the story to you. They're leaving a lot of gaps for you to just kind of figure out and try to guess what's going on as a sighted or an unsighted audience. And without that audio description to fill it in, we, we just completely miss out on those subtleties to help move the story along. Well, to go with Roy's little analogy that he used about the potholes and stuff, if anybody's ever seen like Charlie Chaplin or some vaudeville stuff where they used to go to a scene and they put words on there for a little bit, or they used to have a cue card person over there showing some words to because they were silent a little bit. But if you weren't a great reader or it, you, you're, it was kind of distracting, I mean, they went away from that, obviously, but that's what it is like without audio description. If you took those cue cards away or if you took that scene away where they described what's going on uh, like they used to do. So, or even if there's words down below that you have to follow along too. I mean, there used to be a bouncing ball, but... Um, those were songs, probably, but yeah, that was the sing along. <laughs> yeah, but but still, sometimes, even in the sighted world, some of that reading, that flipping back and forth, for us, we're doing it in our head, trying to piece those pieces together. So, as smooth as it can be, as smooth smooth as that road of audio description in the movie can be, it just gives us all a better ride throughout the movie. Very Look at your cool. genius an- analogy there, Roy. I really Look at felt that. it fall flat on my face. I really did. <laughs> you got to have more confidence in your, on yourself. <laughs> why, did, <laughs> why did the audio description narrator chicken cross the freeway of audio description to avoid the potholes? <laughs> No, yeah. no, I pushed it. See, I pushed it. <laughs> no, no, that one might have gone just a smidge. <laughs> oh, see, take Teamwork, it back. Boy. We'll, we'll, right. we'll get you to the other side. What's it sound like when you go <laughs> off the soapbox? <laughs> <laughs> oh. He actually just makes me kind of, isn't it like it got pushed out of the, like it's not the same steps back what down. Is it? <laughs> oh. no, is it like you're taking the stairwell or what? Like, is there a banister that you slide down? I don't even know. It's I don't feel like it's the same amount of steps back down when you when I get off the soapbox there. Jeff. Huh. I haven't been on it in a while. Huh. No, we'll, we'll have to bring that back. If we do need to bring <laughs> that back. I'll send Roy the clip. <laughs> yeah. Great. You can insert that in. <laughs> how can I how can everybody follow you either on social media or online? For me, I am at Blindy Blog, so it's B L I N D Y B L O G. That's on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Myself on Twitter, I'm known as Jeff. I don't think I have to spell that out, but um, I should, maybe. And you can find me on Blind Abilities. That's blindabilities.com. Um, yeah, or the Blind Abilities tweets and Facebook groups. We have a lot of Facebook groups out there, Blind Abilities, um, Serena, yours? Mine's so long. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the largest group that I run is the assistive technology community for the blind and visually impaired. And then I do also help admin the audio description discussion group as well, which we would love to have as many members as possible join that group. It's growing every day. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Roy. Thanks for, Thanks having, for having us, Roy.